Dr. Kais Balbisi. Oh, thank you, Kais. I like your proactive type of decisions. Dr. Ahmed Chenyan Ali from Iraq, please join us. Dr. Amr Sawair. Dr. Amr. Okay. I'm always to be glad to be back at this very prestigious uh, meeting and uh, thank you Dr. Mahmoud for always putting su together such an unbelievable program very well organized with your scientific committee. So today I'm going to be discussing with you complete revascularization versus incomplete revascularization in multivessel coronary disease. And to start I'm going to point out a very important fact that has been proven over and over by many studies that the natural history of multivessel coronary disease is really determined by the extent of myocardial ischemia and lesion severity. Both are associated with worse prognosis. So the more the ischemia and the more the lesion severities, the worse the prognosis. And this goes with uh, many, uh, along many clinical and uh, uh, anatomical subsets, such as, for example, patient with, who present with STEMI and have multivessel disease, they do worse in terms of MACE and death than patients who present with STEMI and single vessel disease. The same thing goes for patients who present with multivessel disease and have a proximal LAD. They do worse than if they didn't have a proximal LAD. And the same thing goes for left main disease. And if you have higher complex lesions, a higher number of complex lesions, the prognosis is worth. And if you present with, a patient presents with acute coronary syndrome and a chronic total occlusion, the mortality is higher than if you didn't have a chronic total occlusion. So the pre presence of chronic total occlusions uh, connotes the following fact that incomplete percutaneous revascularization that includes a chronic total occlusion may be associated with less favorable outcome. But of course, when you tackle a CTO, you have to be, um, you have to be at least to recognize or confirm the fact that the patient may uh, benefit uh, from the CTO revascularization in terms of having myocardial viability in the territory. So uh, what I've told you so far is that there is an incrementally worse prognosis with the extent of ischemia. And therefore, the question is, is there a potential benefit with early complete revascularization? The answer, and that's the summary probably of my presentation uh, in this sentence, that complete revascularization based on lesion severity is associated with more favorable outcomes than incomplete revascularization. This is the general uh, theme. However, this is derived from studies, from data, and data are clouded by several factors, and we need to always remember that. They're clouded by the fact that the definition of anatomical and functional significance of coronary lesions are uh, not uh, always homogeneous between studies. Also, another factor is the extent of myocardial ischemia at baseline and after revascularization, and even the heterogeneity and how they're measured, the outcome measures. So when we look at studies and quote studies and do meta-analyses, there are all those confounding variables that are not very accurate and we need to keep them in mind. And obviously, we rely a lot on observational studies and much less on randomized studies, because randomized studies happen to, happen to come up uh, much less often than observational studies. So all of those are limitations that you need to keep in mind. So I'm going to, for the rest of this presentation, talk about the clinical categories uh, that are relevant to this topic of complete versus incomplete revascularization. Stable ischemic heart disease, non-urgent ACS, STEMI, and STEMI with cardiogenic shock. First of all, in stable ischemic heart disease and non-urgent ACS, most studies have shown a strong relationship between incomplete revascularization based on anatomical or functional lesion severity and the occurrence of adverse outcomes. I'll give you one example from the ACUITY trial that have addressed patients with acute coronary syndrome. 
what you see up here in the uh, red graph is incomplete revascularization. The MACE rate is higher than achieving complete revascularization with a significant p-value. However, the death rate did not make a difference. But I think what's more important is this particular study derived from the FAME data, whereby patients were revascularized in multivessel disease based on the significance of each lesion by FFR. Lesions revascularized based on FFR less than 0 0.80, the PCI improves outcome. And in fact, when you leave behind lesions that are not significant by a negative FFR, meaning an FFR more than 0 0.80, there is no impact on outcome, no matter what your residual syntax score is or the extent of revascularization measured by the syntax revascularization index. Therefore, if you do complete functional evaluation and revascularization based on the FFR guidance, the residual angiographic lesions that you have not tackled because they are not significant by FFR do not reflect residual ischemia or predict a worse outcome, supporting the fact that using FFR to adopt a functionally complete revascularization is more important than adopting an anatomical or angiographic complete revascularization. We don't do that often, but this would be the more scientific way to do it. And if you have lesions that look to you like they may be borderline, rather than tackling them, you know, get that FFR out and measure. It's financially, um, uh, you know, uh, costly in this part of the world, but it's something to consider. So basically, achieving reasonably complete revascularization based on functional lesion severity is an acceptable strategy in most patients undergoing PCI why, while carefully weighing risks. How about cabbage? Bypass patients going for uh, um, uh, patients with stable ischemic heart disease and non-urgent ACS going for cabbage, complete revascularization based on anatomical lesion severity is associated with more favorable outcomes than incomplete revascularization. In other words, um, if I send a patient to Dr. Latouf, he's going to, uh, I'm not going to do FFR on those lesions. I'm just going to say, you know, go do your job, and he's going to select those uh, juicy arteries, good for bypass, more than 50% and bypass them, and that's very acceptable for complete revascularization. So this is actually, I want to refer you to this very nice review article that came out last year from Greg Stone and Ziad Ali and many important authors. And the recommendation for people presenting with multivessel disease and stable ischemic heart disease or non-ST elevation ACS is that complete revascularization should be achieved when possible. So that's basically their recommendation. But an ischemia-guided approach to complete revascularization is preferred in patients undergoing PCI over anatomical approach. Whereas in bypass surgery, either an anatomically guided approach or an ischemia-guided approach, they're both acceptable. Now let's turn to STEMI, the hot topic, and I will go straight to the most, um, to the largest and latest trial that has tackled this topic, the complete trial. 4,401 patients uh, presented with STEMI and multivessel disease, and they were randomized either to complete revascularization, but this is not during the index procedure. During the index procedure, only primary PCI, okay? For, and then they were staged either within the same hospital, hospitalization or uh, later, versus another 2,025 patients who had only the culprit PCI, culprit STEMI patients done. What this study showed that if you do complete revascularization based on doing the index, uh, based on doing the primary PCI and then stage 
the other lesion uh, is better than doing the culprit lesion only. So therefore, the benefit of complete revascularization was consistently observed regardless of the intended timing of non-culprit lesion PCI. Moving to cardiogenic shock. Can you or should you do the primary PCI culprit lesion and at the same setting do the non-culprit? The answer is no from this study, the culprit shock trial, that shows that you do uh, worse if you do multi-vessel PCI compared to culprit lesion PCI. Um, so, and, and one thing that I need to bring up is that most studies have shown worse outcome in patients undergoing multi-vessel intervention of the infarct-related artery plus non-infarct-related artery lesions during the index procedure. So if you want to do your culprit and non-culprit during the index procedure, it is not really recommended. And taking you to the uh, guidelines, the ACC, AHA, and SKY guidelines, they're very clear about that. They say the following. Staged percutaneous intervention, meaning stage, meaning either during the same hospitalization or after discharge, of a significantly stenosed non-culprit artery in patients presenting with STEMI is recommended in selected patients to improve outcomes. Percutaneous intervention of the non-culprit artery at the time of primary PCI, the data there is less clear, that's what the guidelines say, you could consider that in stable patients. So if today I do this STEMI right coronary artery and I have this one lesion in a marginal, big marginal artery that's tight, patient is stable, kidney function is fine, you know, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, not three o'clock in the morning, maybe I could think of do, doing it. But cardiogenic shock, I'm only going to do the primary uh, PCI lesion, the culprit lesion, during, during the index procedure. The same thing uh, comes from the guidelines of the ESC, whereby in cardiogenic shock, routine revascularization of the non-infarct-related artery is not recommended. Okay, you remember there was a debate about that a few years ago. But now it's clear, just do your primary. You only do the non-culprit if the patient is not coming out of shock and you think the non-culprit may be contributing to the problem. Um, and um, the optimal timing, they say, of the regular STEMI to do the other, the other uh, vessel is uh, not known. They do leave room for tackling non-culprit lesion during the same primary PCI procedure if you think that lesion is very unstable. So for example, three o'clock in the morning today, Friday, I did this LAD, but I'm looking at that right it looks very tight, it looks clotty, it looks like it cannot wait till Monday to be done. You know, maybe I'll allow myself to do it because of the sort of un instability of the lesion. Always remember that when you want to lead to get to adequacy of complete revascularization, it's not just the lesion. It's how much residual myocardium ischemia you're leaving behind and then how well have you done those vessels you know, have you, have you done the FFR after stenting? You don't have to, but at least you want to be convinced that you're really helping the patient with reducing the burden of myocardial uh, ischemia. Um, finally, so, so bo bottom line, use a lot of common sense. So finally, I'll give you this example of this 83-year-old lady who presented with an inferior STEMI. Everything I've told you here today even though there were many trials that supported, it makes sense. This is what all of us have been doing in this room over the years. There's nothing new about this. This is an 83-year-old, comes in with an inferior STEMI. We fixed the right, but there's also the left, LED diagonal OM. Fine, you know, I fixed it four days later within the same hospitalization, and, and that worked fine. I'll give you another example of a patient I did yesterday. A patient with multi who presented only with a very high calcium score, 3,300, 
Every two years, I do a stress echo on him, and it's negative. He told me, this time, I want a cath. I don't want to debate this whether I should have done the cath or not. Left system looked like this. There is this diagonal here, medium-sized diagonal, and there is this osteal PDA, asymptomatic. Should I tackle them? No. In other words, use a lot of judgment. These are osteal lesions. Even if they were not osteal, don't go after nitty-gritty things. Just look at the big picture and how we're going to help the patient. Thank you. Ziad, Ziad, thank you very much for this elegant lecture and staying on time and giving us 10 seconds and five minutes to discuss. Panelists, colleagues, any questions for Dr. Ziad, please? If there is no hot question here, I'll start one. Um, STEMI, multi-vessel disease, culprit and non-culprit. FFR data coming out, kind of wishy-washy. What would you do? I mean, it says that angiographic evidence is in doing a STEMI might yeah. be as good as doing an FFR in a non-culprit. You, you can do the FFR in the non-culprit uh, vessel during the STEMI. So, if it, so that's one thing you, you, you know you want to, because you're, you're raising a very important point. Uh, so I have, I've, I've finished my LAD, patient is stable, and I have an OM and a right, and I'm not sure if they're really tight. So what choice do I have? Doing an FFR now versus doing what later? A stress thallium, that won't work. The patient has just has a STEMI, and it's not going to confuse the issue. So it's not wrong to do that at the time, or bring the patient back and do them at your leisure. In, in, in cases of this STEMI where the patient uh, gets spontaneously reperfused and now he's not in pain, he doesn't have wall motion abnormality, his ECG is normalized. Does this alter your uh, decision? About? To uh, revascularize completely or to c do the culprit lesion? So if you have a patient with, let's say, an LAD STEMI that revascularizes, so I'm taking the patient to the cath more electively, you're saying? Okay, he, he reached the cath lab without pain, free but, of pain. But I did the cath. Yeah, so, so no, I no, do no. the cath. I'm talking about that subgroup, those who uh, reperfuse spontaneously, their ECG become normalized, no more wash, more, I, I more think, more so, so, yeah, no, I, I, and it's I understand. it's subtotally occluded, it's yeah. not totally occluded. Subtotally, but to me three flow, then you can deal with it like any ACS. I, I, would, I would just deal, because it's, you're out of the hot area by now. Okay. Uh, it's an important question. I mean, we used to call those in the States aborted amides, remember? That you aborted the myocardial infarction, patient is in the cat table, no ST elevation, no chest pain, and, but you have a tight lesion, which was the culprit an hour ago. So I think you're obligated to fix it after all. Yeah. We have, please. Hisham Nassar from Palestine. Hisham, it's lovely to have you Thank with you us. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hisham is coming to us. Allah hayya Palestine kullha. Islam, Islam. It's lovely to have you with us, Hisham. Thank Please. you very much. Please. A very nice talk about the non-culprit region. What do you do if you have the non-culprit region in the same artery and proximal to the culprit region? You do it. For example, 80% LED and the culprit is mid-LED. Uh, mid you do the proximal or you leave? You do it. You do it, even if it's distal. So, 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 uh, so that's an important question. So if you have the LED, the culprit is in the mid, but you have one more proximal. So now my threshold is much lower to deal with it, even if it's not functionally significant. Let's say it looks like 60, 70, whether it's before or after, because I do worry about the, the full flow to the stent. And, and I, I would do it. Of course, if it looks 40, you know, I'd, I'd leave it alone. But that's, that, that, that's a good question. That's a beautiful question, Hisham. I mean, we're talking in the guidelines. It's not culprit lesion revascularization. It's right. culprit vessel revascularization. Right, so right. I mean, and those, the the, this is difficult to tease out from the study. This is more like using your experience. We have another one minute and uh, 20 seconds in the bag. If the culprit lesion in the mid-LED and you have the 80% proximal with bifurcation big diagonal, you still do it? You have to. 
No, the culprit is in the middle. Yeah, yeah, you, you have to, because... And you have 80% stable, stable plaque. Yeah, but the with, flow with to the... diagonal and also the austere diagonal. You start doing at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, the kissing in the proximal, or you leave it if the patient is stable and the plaque is stable. Yeah, no, the same artery, I would do it all, because, again, it's a matter of providing the best flow to that artery that you're stenting. Yeah. Any other so, questions, panelists, my colleague, audience? Um, Zia, thank you very much. Please, you Okay, the, the, the next speaker from Iraq uh, will be Dr. Ahmed Shnein Ali. Uh, he, he'll, he'll talk about challenges in coronary ectasia. Bismillah uh, uh, ar-Rahim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today I'm going to share a review about the challenges in coronary ectasia and their impact on the coronary intervention in the setting of acute and elective intervention. Uh, this diagram uh, explains a lot of facts about the coronary ectasia. Really, it is a form of dilatation which is more than 1.5 diameter of the normal artery. It is either uh, localized or diffused. When it is diffused, we call it coronary ectasia. When it is localized, it is an aneurysm. And we have secular, when the transverse diameter is larger than the longitudinal, we call it secular, and when the reverse, we call, we call it fusiform. And when the diameter is more than four times of the reference artery, we call it giant coronary aneurysm. And in certain situations, we are dealing with a true aneurysm when the all three layers involved, and where part of them will be lost, we call it the pseudo aneurysm. How it is presented? We have a range of presentation, and at one end, it is completely asymptomatic, and at the other end, there is an exertional symptoms. And mainly, the exertional symptoms are really related to the loss of reserve function of the normal arteries. In between, we have acute coronary syndrome. This related to two facts. The first one, loss of uh, reserve function. And secondly, there is a form of turbulence in the blood flow, plus added factor. This will lead definitely to a creation of a thrombus, either locally or disseminated distally. And our patient will present with a form of acute coronary syndrome. And in rare cases, we are facing a sort of rupturing in the aneurysm. Our patient is a male, 59 years. He's a heavy smoker, not hypertensive, not diabetic. Presented with a form of acute inferior C elevation MI, chest pain, ECG changes with positive troponin, and he was hemodynamically stable, but in a state of severe chest pain. Immediately, he was transferred to the cath lab uh, for the aim is for primary intervention. We started routinely with the NGO of the left system, and this was the appearance, it is a really an ugly appearance of the left system, mainly the LID. Throughout the length, it is diffusely disease with multiple critical areas and certain sites for aneurysmal dilatation. Whenever we face this a form of uh, changes, we expect we are facing the same changes on the other artery. And that's what we find in the RCA. There is a mid-total occlusion within areas of uh, ectasia. The first thing, we have passing a wire, and we obtain some form of a flow. And this clearly explains the presence of uh, heavy thrombus burden. Whenever I face such a form of uh, lesion, the first thing I am going to do is the using of uh, mechanical aspiration. And we have aspirate by using 60 French aspiration catheter, and this was the result after aspiration. Uh, a big thrombus burden was aspirated, but still we are having a residual thrombus and tight lesion at the site before the bifurcation, and the, site, and the lesion after bifurcation is most likely due to a localized spasm. At this stage, I am planning to do a focal stenting at the site, which is considered for me the unstable site, and avoid using a long stent in such a lesion in order to decrease the risk of subsequent complication. So I select a stent 4 by 16, and this the positioning. This is the profile of a stent inflation. And this was the result. And this was the final result. Even the distal lesion has become more uh, 
better than the previous appearance. At this stage, I think it is functionally, and for the safety, it is the best to stop at this stage regarding the dealing with a case of acute myocardial infarction. And then the question come about the management of the LID. How we are going to do for it? Is it medical treatment, depending on the symptom or others? What sort of management if I decide, either BCI or cabbage? And I think it is um, any, this related to the previous uh, discussion and the previous session about the revascularization and the setting of acute MI, which is, was covered nicely by the last American guidelines, which postulated that revascularization of non infarct artery in patients with STEMI, it is class one, and it is important in order to decrease the risk of death and MI. The intervention, class one, and the surgery, class 2A, depending on the complexity of the procedure. And now the question, how I could perform a safe procedure in this patient? Regarding the vascular access, could be, uh, the procedure is done on elective base, and we could use either uh, femoral or radial. My uh, default is the radial. Regarding the guide catheter, we have a range of selection, and the backup is not a matter of great uh, importance in this patient. The most important is the guide wire should be selected. The tip should be non-traumatic, uh, low weight, and uh, good trackability in order to drive our wire safely within this LID. The support should be medium support, and then we start with ballooning of the lesion. We have to deal it so delicate, uh, starting with a small balloon and increasing gradually in order to uh, make a good space for passing of the stent. And then we stenting from the distal to the proximal. And the most important is the post stenting dilatation of the areas of ectasia. Uh, one of the important, find, uh, important procedure to be done is the imaging after the uh, stenting for better result. But unfortunately, we have a shortage at that time. So what we do, this is the LID, another review for it, passing of the wire, and then I use a small balloon to dilate the most critical site, and then larger balloon and longer, multiple site on inflation, and then starting with stenting, the first stent, mid, and then the most proximal one, ending with multiple sites of post stenting dilation. And this was the result of LID. What is the conclusion? Coronary ectasia, it is a diffuse or focalized form of dilatation. It is reported in up to 5% of the patients who are, who are the going coronary NGO. Clinically, it is presented either asymptomatic or acute coronary syndrome or in form of a chronic angina. Management of this patient is really a challenging and the treatment option, including many options, and there is no uh, standardized treatment and this depends on the experience. The natural history and behavior, it is need to be addressed fully and we are in need for large multi center studies in order to make a guideline proper for the management of this lesion. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you saved us two minutes and plus five minutes of discussion. Let me just start by asking you a question which uh, I'm sure a lot of people would be asking. Ectasia is when you see a diameter of a vessel referred to the diameter uh, of the reference vessel of 1.5 yeah. or a bit higher. Uh, your right coronary is a bit bigger, but I'm not quite sure it defines ectasia the way we know it. I don't know if you all agree with me. Yes. So, uh, so th this is one point. The other point seems to be one of your day-to-day -day cases, type 1 MI, atherosclerotic lesion, full of thrombi, a lot of spasm there. You did a beautiful job. and. You know, doing a step, you did a stepwise uh, intervention, right? So thank you very much. That's by guidelines, of course. Any questions, colleagues? Uh, w whether he gave uh, nitro. Did you give nitro through this procedure? Uh, pressure was on low side, so I cannot, I have no choice to giving a nitro for this patient. M many lo legions in, uh, yeah. seen, uh, seem to be 
spastic. Yeah, I, I thought at that time this area which considered spastic, I consider this the really the normal RCA. And the areas in between, it is the ectatic area. Oh, okay. And when I put the stent, it was uh, 4 by 16. And even when I put it hyper inflate, it is less than the diameter of the previous and for this. So he, he diagnosed his ectasia based on the very small vessel, which you think is spastic. So it's kind of. Uh, please, a question from the floor. They use of a stent as much as you can. I think that's another brilliant point. I yeah. don't know what you think of that. Uh, of course, Colombo is the one who is pioneering this all over the world now. You have long lesions. Why do you have to put metal in that very yeah. long lesion? Do uh, balloon angioplasty. I'm sorry, for, and then dug a little balloon, and then go wherever, put a stent wherever you're not satisfied with the result. Yeah, your comment. Uh, I agree with you. It is still one of the choices. But uh, the vessel, it is unhealthy from the distal to the proximal. And even in my procedure from the wire to, to, to the ballooning, I was so uh, fragile in dealing with it. At any stage, I may lose. And even it was not uh, measured at the time, I ended with uh, no reflow after ballooning. So I was afraid of dealing with a higher pressure balloon in order to optimize the vessel and then to bring the regulutant balloon, which is really a vehicle. At this time, I end with dissection, and even the areas of aneurysmal dilate section, aneurysmal area will not be covered when I'm doing just angioplasty. By using of the stent, I am uh, going to cover these areas, and with the time, this, like, uh, this will act even like the uh, graft stent and obliteration of this, and we are going to get a nice appearing artery regarding the appearance. The best, the best of the two words, actually, is to, for those very long lesions, is to use a drug looting balloon and imaging. You need imaging to perfect your job in those cases, really. You agree, yes, Kais, uh, of course. The, the, Dr. Benaventura is pioneering uh, th this job in Germany. Uh, he, he recommends not to stent a legion unless you get the section type C. And you wait for five minutes, you see, if there is no change on, the, on, the, on it, you don't stent it. It you is know, a, that, it's an unhealthy that, vessel and we, are in, sure. we may left with, with unhealthy area along the artery. And this may make it liable for subsequent complications. So I select to stent this unhealthy yeah, from while, the start areas. While we are on this point, just for the sake yeah. of science here, is dissections, fix them. You also can guide them with a very simple pressure wire just to, ch to check what is the transgradient wire across the dissection and your vessel. And if it's more than 20, you'll probably have to fix it either ways. But, but brilliant things, but please, you have a question? I have two questions, short uh, questions. First of all, if you have a, a nice case, of, uh, the, and if you have a, a large a burden of thrombus and TIMI flow of three, will you defer the uh, stent implantation to uh, another separate session? Uh, this is the first question, and uh, what about the place of uh, the automatic mechanical, mechanical uh, aspiration that was used in the cheetah trial? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regarding the first question regarding use of uh, aspiration, usually in our practice when we did aspiration and we end with even a residual thrombus and timothy flow, we keep the patient on anticoagulation, and dual antiplatelet, and we then we do a controlled angio. But in this patient in particular, uh, the area it is unhealthy, it is ectatic, and there is a high risk of recurrence. For this reason, I choose to select a focal stenting for this. And regarding the second question, uh, we don't have the uh, experience and availability over the aspiration of mechanical, only the manual aspiration. Only what? Uh, manual. Oh, oh, manual. Manual. Okay. Manual. Uh, that's another, I mean, great questions are coming from the floor. They need more lectures, actually, about yeah. the same subject. Uh, the first TEMI as a routine type of approach is not recommended. So you don't the first TEMI from the start. However, as you said eloquently, you go to the cat lab, you do angiogram, your culprit is full of 
of, of, of clots, but you have a TIMI3 flow, you have a patient who's stable, ST is subsiding, yes, you can defer that because you are afraid of getting no reflow. I think that was the question coming from the floor. Did you have a question, sir? Can you stand up and tell us? Thank you, Doctor, for the presentation. My uh, question, do you calculate syntax score about, uh, before you do PCI? This is a question. Then LED is small and tortuous and calcific. If you do only pylon to the RCL, achieve TM3 flow, and then agristat and refer a patient to the mini cabbage, Limalad, better or this? And what's about the proximal RCA? You fixed or not? Yeah. Uh, regarding the first question and the using of syntax, it is used in the setting of uh, chronic stable hygiene rather than in the setting uh, of. After, after yeah, yeah, I explain by the guideline the on. management in the setting of acute. It, is, it will be done time's either up. in the index okay, of period up. of addition or even after. So the guideline of, uh, of intervention in the setting of acute. Am I, it is different from that in the chronic. Thank you very much. Uh, we, have, well, we are a bit over time. Thank you so much. Thank we, you. we appreciate that. Obviously, the discussion is very hot here. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, but just we have to go with the time. Allow us to do that. Uh, allow me to introduce the next speaker. Uh, he is on the panels here, Dr. Kais Balbisi. Uh, Kais, I don't know how to, to, to actually introduce you. All what I can tell you, I get to know you in the past several years. With all due humbleness, you are one of the most brilliant scientific, uh, you approach, uh, and I, I really respect what you do, uh, guys. Please, uh, you, you're going to give us a lecture, a blast or a drill, a case of intracoronary lithotripsy. Please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Hadi, for such a great introduction and a very pleasant words. Hello? Yeah. All right. So, uh, blast or drill, a case of coronary intravascular lithotripsy. So, uh, these are the objectives. I have no disclosure. And I'll try to go through it kind of quick so we can, you know, cover what we, the important points that we'd like to take. So, our patient is 58-year-old male who presents with dyspnea and chest pains, more on exertion. He has history of heart failure, systolic mainly due to ischemic cardiomyopathy. His echo showed an EF of 20 to 25%. He has severe multivessel coronary artery disease and he was deemed not a candidate for bypass. He was seen by our surgeons, and they said, no, we can't do it, given his multiple comorbidities. So he underwent already a PCI to the RCA and LAD. He's on end-stage renal dialysis on hemodial uh, on hemodialysis and uh, advanced peripheral arterial disease with dry gangrene, and multiple comorbidities, still having symptoms. So this is his coronary angiography. These are the shots uh, of the right. Why are they not playing? All right, and this is the, coro the right coronary and the LED. So we can see they're both kind of uh, patent and the stents that were placed are already okay. There's some gel diagonal, but overall it's good. Now, so coming to the actual significant lesion. So I hope it will project here well, but if you notice the osteal circ has a very tight lesion, heavily calcified and very eccentric. And uh, this was a nightmare to cross. And we could barely uh, cross it with the uh, with a wire, but ultimately we got it done. Now, um, so we crossed it. Now the question is, of course, this was a planned procedure. So we already were prepared to kind of deal with the calcium. We said this is not a legion to handle in the from the start with just ad hoc ballooning. And we had our, um, intravascular lithotripsy ready. And I'll talk about that later, why we chose IVL in contrast to ROTA. Uh, of course, the, unfortunately, one of the major challenges of IVL is to cross. So I didn't cross that legion. So what we did is we did a little bit of predilation, and that's one of the advantages of IVL, is that you could still use some balloon predilations before. Uh, not as much as with ROTA when you're worried about microdissections and the problem uh, if you do ROTA on top of a already existing uh, micro dissections. Then, of course, we ended up starting with the IVL therapy. We did it distally and proximally. I did 20 uh, uh, treatments for the most distal, 30 in the middle, and then 30 for the most proximal lesion. After that, 
this is the results after the IVL. And you can appreciate that that chunk of calcium is much better. And it's actually uh, um, wide open now. And we were very lucky that even the stent passed. Sometimes you might need after IVL to uh, do some post dilation, but we were lucky the stent went in smoothly and without so many balloon dilations. We've only used a one and a half pre-dilation balloon and then the IVL catheter went through, then the stent went through. So it was uh, the planning ahead made a huge difference for uh, our patient and a very complex eccentric lesion became relatively easy due to using this uh, device. And uh, post PCI, this is uh, the results, and you can see, thankfully, the, uh, the all side branches were maintained, we have good flow, and uh, overall the results were okay. So again, to kind of highlight a few things, uh, about our thing. First of all, coronary calcification. Coronary calcification is a big challenge. So it's actually a very common problem. It's around 33% in all legions. And if you look at IVIS studies, it's even more common, around 50%. And it provides a severe, uh, tight legion, irregular, with rough surface and a non-compliant. These are a disaster for recipe. Heavy calcium legion can cause you know, wire and um, difficulties in crossing both wire, balloon, and stents. It can co the rigid legion will cause residual stenosis, dissections, and suboptimal expansion. And ultimately, this will lead to complications such as instant thrombosis due to incomplete expansion, instant restenosis becomes very common, perforations, which is a nightmare, and dissections, which could be either in the vessel itself, an edge, or due to your guiding catheter, an aggressive manipulation of your guiding catheter, you could have a left main or an osteal dissection which is another nightmare. So again, calcification carries a lot of risk for your patient, and it could cause slow or no reflow. So the idea is to do plaque modification, and we have a lot of tools for plaque modification. You can see the benefits of plaque modifications in multiple levels. So, and these are trials that have shown how plaque modification makes a difference. All right, and these are actually the two trials that have shown that atherectomy, with the sole ro need role for plaque modifications, uh, is actually more useful than atherectomy for treatment. All right, so what is a IVL? IVL is a ultrasound uh, catheter with a balloon that is inflated just to increase the contact. Uh, these are the profile, and what it does, it does, it cracks the calcium. So it doesn't embolize the calcium, it cracks the calcium to make it more compliant, more pliable. And with, this is exactly what happened with us. So we, we kind of cracked that calcium and we could pass the stents easily and then stent the legion afterwards. So that's the main benefit from uh, IVL. Now, what are the tools that we have? We have rota, orbital, eczema, and intravascular lithotripsy. Rota is a crown with diamonds, so you are actually drilling. Now, orbital atherectomy is more of a spinning thing with a uh, rotational, and the higher the speed, the more lumen you get. Eczema is a burning, so you're kind of uh, burning through the legion. And then intravascular lithotripsy is what we just talked about, which is cracking the calcium with ultrasonic waves. Now, what are the major complications of atherectomy? What is the nightmare of atherectomy? Perforations, you know? And if you, uh, that's a major complication, you'll end up with a big compl uh, complication, potentially open heart to kind of save the patient. Restenosis, slow flow, and at the worst of all is burr entrapment if it gets stuck in your legion. These are trials that have shown the benefit of ROTA, and these are the two big trials that have shown the benefit of IVL, disrupt coronary disease two, one, two and three. Now, just to summarize the differences between the different techniques for atherectomy, a rotational atherectomy is great as an excellent debulking mechanism. It opens uncrossable legions. Orbital, the benefit of it, the disadvantages of rota is that you sometimes need big French sizes, there's wire bias which can cause perforations and a lot of complications. Orbital atherectomy, you don't need the bigger size Frenches, but still has wire bias. Eczema is very difficult to cross. It's very useful for instant stenosis, but very difficult to cross. Intravascular erythotripsy solves some of these potential disadvantages of the other techniques and can be very useful. The only problem is if it's an uncrossable legion, it is very difficult to 
to pass uh, unless you do some predilation before. And it provides less debulking if you have a very heavily uh, decalcified uh, lesion. Ultimately, I want to uh, finish my uh, discussion with this uh, nice algorithm uh, to kind of how to approach uh, calcifications. If you're talking about mild calcifications, you just need to do balloon predilation and stent as usual. But if it is a moderate to severe calcification, there's a kind of an IVAS score uh, looking at the arc of calcium, if it's more than 180 to 270, versus uh, if it, the length of calcium and the depth. And if it goes, if it has its scores high, then you probably uh, need to do rotational atherectomy. So if three to five, uh, if it's one to two points, it's low score, then you can actually proceed with uh, NC balloons. And if it doesn't work, then you can add lithotripsy. If it's high, go for lithotripsy. If it's uncrossable legion, probably you're better off starting with rota and orbital. And if, uh, if you start with lithotripsy and it doesn't work, you could switch to uh, rota and orbital and other way, uh, vice around. If you have a rota and doesn't provide you enough, you can go back to lithotripsy. So it's a kind of back and forth. And ultimately, you need to stent and get uh, your images uh, with the IVAS to optimize your uh, stenting procedure. All right, I think I'm just at time. Thank you very much, and I'll, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Kais. Uh, really, it was a great uh, talk. Uh, we, we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Thank you, Dr. Kais. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, what's the role of IVL in instant restenosis? Great. So, excellent question. Right now, until now, there's no studies to actually test it in that setting, okay? But it can be used off-label. Uh, it can help. Now, the problem is uh, with instant restenosis, most of the instant restenosis is uh, fibrous tissue and new atheroma. Uh, and of course the metal itself. Now, um, so that might not be as much responsive to IVL as you'd like. Uh, so it probably is not as optimal and you're better off with the other options. Uh, of course, if you're also dealing with a very, um, the reason for instant restenosis is an under-expanded stent, uh, then you might find it difficult to pass the lithotripsy. So you could use it off-label but I don't think it's the first choice. Uh, Dr. Kais, uh, uh, based on what criteria you select your patients for uh, uh, debulking? Do, yes. do, do you uh, wait, uh, uh, for example, uh, you test the legion with a balloon, if it's not uh, expanding, you, you decide to go for Excellent. debulking or yes. uh, it's a routine uh, job. Yes, thank you. Thank you for such a great question. So basically, yes. So first of all, there are a few things. Now, if I'm lucky and I have IVUS and I find that this legion looks, you know, heavily calcified, but I'm not sure it's circumferential calcification or not, then I could use the IVUS and get those criteria that we talked about. Now, if we don't have IVUS, we can do the poor man IVUS, which is, you know, doing a dry cine in multiple orthogonal views and to see how much calcium there is in the vessel and whether it's circumferential and how thick or how, what's the burden there. If it's really heavily calcified, then I would try to avoid doing an ad hoc procedure. And I would go directly to atherectomy for plaque modification like this patient. I knew he was d difficult from the beginning. So I never tried doing the circ from the beginning. I left it to the end. I set up myself from the beginning for plaque modification and went there directly. Now, sometimes we might get fooled or greedy and say, oh, maybe it's not as bad calcification, and you start with the dilation. Now, and then you're stuck, uh, you can't cross your stent. So lithotripsy works, you can do it. You could still do rota, but sometimes we're a little bit worried with having some micro dissections uh, beforehand and doing rota on top of it. It's not a contraindication, but it might increase your risk of complications a little bit, so you need to be a little bit more careful. And, uh, but it's still uh, doable. Or you, if you feel the patient is stable enough, you could let him chill a little bit, you know, uh, for a couple of weeks, to heal those micro dissections, and then approach it from the beginning with planned atherectomy. Okay, thank you. This is great. Yeah. I have a comment regarding the use of IVL in the ISR. Definitely, there is not any data 
supporting the use of the IV on the ISR. Because the ISR, you should know the mechanism of why the NCRO cell failure have been happened. And getting back to the mechanism of action of the IVL is making a crack in the in the in the in the sub in the uh, intima. So the only the only available indication for use of the IVL in the lacing failure is whenever you have gold stent and the expansion due to the large bulk of calcium. We have some cases like that when you have got the stent is not expanded well during the index procedure. There is some place for making IVL because we are going to make a crack in the calcium behind the implanted stand. This is the only overlabel indication. And this should be done to mention that it's better to do after 12 months of the first uh, procedure because at that time you have got good endothelialization of the, of the stand. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's exactly what I said. You know, the, the pathophysiology of ISR is not as much calcium. It's actually new intimal high, uh, growth and uh, fibroelastic, uh, fibrous tissue growth, so it won't respond to IVL as much. And uh, it, if it's calcium, then IVL would be a useful uh, point. Right. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Hassan. Yeah, yeah, one of my questions uh, close to uh, my colleague. You know, if you put the stent acutely uh, after you blast it and you still find there is some residual calcium behind the struts, would you go back with another balloon and blast it again from inside the stent or? Oh, afterwards, you mean? Yes. Uh, so, yes, you can. You can. But probably you need to have a proper uh, plaque modification before. You know, that's why, that's what I was saying. So if you feel like you have not opened up the vessel enough before you put the stent, you should do non-compliant. Yeah. Oh, you want to do IVL after? After you've deployed the stent? Oh, yes. So there's no data to say whether yes or no. Technically, um, it should, but uh, I'm not, I, I cannot speak out of it because this is off, uh, it's, there's no data to support that. M yeah. Maybe balloon, uh, balloon shock wave works here? Who's Sorry? B balloon shock wave maybe works here in, in the... Balloon drug, you mean drug eluding balloon? No, no, shock wave. Yes. The IVL to, uh, to, to, to uh, crack. To crack the, the, the calcium, calcium after behind of it. After, after you have deployed a stent and it's not expanding, as Dr. Uh, Asim. Um, May so, that help? Yeah, so again, right now I'm going to be speaking outside the scope of literature. There is no data to say yes or no, but yes, you can. Technically, I mean, uh, if you think the calcium is there, and you want to get it uh, cracked so you can then pass your uh, NC balloon and dilate it. Probably you can, but that's off-label. That is off-label. And there's no data to say yes or no. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Actually, yes. I have one question and one comment. Is there any experience with the IVL in the peripheral intervention? Yes. And yes. Uh, yeah. And the second one, uh, it's recommended uh, Only one question, please, and short uh, answer. To, okay. to, to monitor the ECG during the IVL, because it could, uh -huh. okay. it could produce or activate some of the dangerous arrhythmia during the IVL shocking. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, quick answer. Uh, the first one is, yes, it's very much, it was actually previously used, uh, was firstly used in peripheral arterial, then they moved to coronary, so the peripheral arterial is even more established for lithotripsy. Second part is, yes, it causes ectopy, uh, and that's why you shouldn't do too many shocks at one. You do 10 in a series, then you wait for 10, 30 seconds, and you do 10 in a series, and then you wait. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kais. Uh, You're welcome. It was a great Thank talk you. and Appreciate really interesting. <laughs> I would like to invite Dr. Khalil Msallam to present a case of cardiac tamponade after removal of temporary pacemaker. Good evening, uh, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here in this meeting between our colleagues and our seniors. I will introduce a case of cardiac tamponade after removal of uh, TPM wire. All of us knows that cardiac tamponade is rapid accumulation of uh, fluid inside the pericardial sac. Myocardial perforation is a rare complication following pacemaker implantation. It does, it, if it does occur, it's usually a time of lead insertion. 
Tamponatu usually take place due to arrowhead endocardial electrode. Fatal myocardial perforation occur with this electrode and the apex of the right ventricle. The apex of the right ventricle and the lateral wall of the right ventricle is 0.5 centimeter. The septum of the right ventricle is about 0.9 to 1 centimeter. Uh, so it's preferred place not to put it in the uh, apex of the right ventricle. This condition requires urgent recognition since the prompt drainage of the pericardial fluid may be life-saving. Rapid uh, refreshing of our information about uh, the pericardium, the parietal uh, pericardium, visceral pericardium, the visceral pericardium secreted by the mesothelial cells, the pericardial fluid that is normally 15 to uh, f uh, 50 mil in the pericardial sac, which is the normal physiological pericardial fluid inside uh, the pericardium. About the pathophysiology, um, we all know if there is increase in the pericardial pressure, if there is increase in the pericardial pressure, they will be transmitted to all chambers of the right of the of the heart. Uh, this will make a decrease in the transmural right atrial pressure and increase in the central venous pressure. That will impair drain, impair uh, RV filling. The RV filling, uh, the RV filling occurs at expense of the LV filling and occur what we call ventricular interdependence during inspiration. Decrease increase in the stroke volume through the right ventricle and decrease in the stroke volume. Uh, from the left ventricle, and uh, uh, the opposite occurred during the expiratory phase. The physiological compensatory mechanism rapidly. Physiological compensatory mechanism with cardiac tamponade is sympathetic stimulation. The sympathetic stimulation leads to uh, tachycardia and uh, vas uh, peripheral vasoconstriction or activation of renal angiotensin system fluid accumulation to overwhelm, uh, overcome the uh, RV uh, diastolic film that is impaired by the uh, increase the venous pressure. Uh, the pericard, the, the heart, the right artery, and the right ventricle will not stretch. Therefore, we see in the cardiac tamponade there is no increase in the ANP or BNPs. In the physical exam, not just the blood pressure we look for. No, we look either there's called what hypertensive tamponade. The pa patient may have high blood pressure and decrease in his blood pressure more than 30 in systolic blood pressure. The most important is the pulsus paradoxicus, which is, like I said, in the pathophysiology, decrease in the systolic blood pressure more than 10 millimeter during inspiration. Uh, echo findings during uh, cardiac tamponade, uh, the most specific, I will go for the most specific sign, is the diastolic versor of the hepatic venous uh, flow during the expiratory phase. Plus that in the tricuspid valve during pulse wave uh, echo, we see that increase in the uh, inspiration more, uh, phase in more than 50% uh, uh, and in the mitral flow decrease uh, more than 30%. Pericardial tamponade rise from multiple traumatic and non-traumatic etiologies. Traumatic pericardial 2%, mortality exceeds 60%. Tamponade has a result, like I said, from cardiac cath, venous cath, intracardiac injection, cardiac surgery, sternal bone biopsy, and for sure, transvenous pacemaker insertion. Injury causes thrombus formation, adherence of the wire to the endocardium. Early recognition, treatment of cardiac tamponade essential to prevent fatal outcome. Other predictors of higher perforation due to temporary pacemaker, acute stimulus and stimulus due to thinning of the myocardium, steroid use, steroid use said cardiac atrophy due to release of the protein, muscle ring factor one, low body mass, advanced age. Predictor with low perforation potential, pulmonary artery pressure above 35 due to protective effect of hypertrophied right ventricle, and BMI more than 30. Tamponade management, all we know is the pericardiosynthesis, but uh, if you want till the you do the pericardiosynthesis, you must give IV fluid till 500 mil, not to overwhelm the compensatory mechanism of the right ventricle and the ventricular interdependence at the pathophysiology of it. The enotropes, the best enotropes to, uh, that we need positive chronotropics, decrease the afterload and decrease the right atrial pressure. The best of them is the dopamine, dobutamine, and isoproterenol, isoprenine. We saw that the isoproterenol is the best that increase ejection fraction with a greater decrease in the insystolic uh, than in the diastolic ventricular volume. The so definitive treatment is cardiac uh, removal of the cardiac diastolic restriction by pericardiogenesis. Even removal of little 50 ml of fluid is often sufficient to correct the hypotension. Right ventricular perforation, uncommon, life-threatening, uh, temporary pacemaker incidence just only 0.1 to 0.8%. I would like to, to introduce uh, my case that uh, happened at uh, my night shift. 56-year-old uh, male patient who is heavy smoker, 40-pack years. DM more than 25 years on oral hypoglycemic agent and hypertension. 
He was complaining of severe anginal pain two hours prior to his admission, excessive diaphoresis, vomiting twice, dizziness without syncopal attacks. Uh, admitted through ER with acute inferior STEMI, associated with complete heart block, ventricular rate 35 beat per minute, narrow complex without increasing heart rate even after atropine injection, normal lab results, still flat cardiac enzymes. Echo done upon arrival to the CCU, uh, inferior wall hypokinesia, no pericardial effusion seen. Immediate activation of the cath lab done, right femoral arterial axis, right femoral venous axis. TPM was inserted as he was still in complete heart block. Uh, even TPM was much angulated with difficult entrance actually. Its final result wasn't very satisfying, but because of his condition at night on cold shift, watchful waiting was the policy for the TPM. That's how was the... The lift system was normal. His right system, there are, there, it's RCA dominant, uh, mid-eccentric, uh, about 50 to 60 legion, and the distal pre-bifurcation was thrombotic uh, occlusion. Here we see the pacemaker much angulated, and it's in the free lateral wall of the right ventricle. After wiring, uh, 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 primary PCI done to the culprit vessel, we deployed two stents. Still here, the 225 and 275 flat with each other, sandwich with each other, sorry. And this is... See the pacemaker, the tip of the endocardial lead is the heart border and it's... We, we do this legion also as complete visual revascularization. And this is the final result. <clears throat> you could then post cath, normal LV function, no pericardial effusion, patient admitted to the CCU. Second day, early morning, severe anginal pain, ECG finding was inferior injury, no acute ischemic changes. Echo done immediately with reassuring result and no pericardial effusion. Patient back to his own rhythm due to his intractable anginal pain. Patient transferred to the cath lab. Decision was to remove temporary pacemaker at cath lab under fluoroscopy and eco guidance with preparation of pericardial synthesis kit and informing cardiac surgeon with high possibility of cardiac tamponade after removing TPM wire because of sealing effect that was protecting the pericardium against low RV pressure. Massive pericardial effusion occurred after removing TPM wire. Hemodynamically unstable patient, hypotension, tachycardia, bradyarrhythmia, and asystole immediately occurred. CPR initiated, pericardial synthesis done immediately. It was prepared everything for him. Even autotransfusion auto -transfusion of blood through his femoral vein sheet, again, full level of consciousness, blood pressure back to 100 over 60. Continuous pericardial synthesis and autologous blood transfusion till he reached the theater. Immediate surgery done with RV patch that was deployed by cardiac surgeon, 24 hour patient extubated, discharged after one week with his baseline hemoglobin level. Pull up at cardiac clinic multiple times since that event, which is more than one year, without any symptoms. For take home message, I finished my presentation. Uh, prompt diagnosis treatment is the key for cardiac tamponade. Don't remove TPM wire or symptom of symptomatic patient without echo or fluoroscopic guidance. 
highly suspicious patient, highly suspicious patient with TPM wire that act as sealing effect. Surgeon must be informed and the operation room activated. Autologous blood transfusion is extremely helpful in this case during the preoperative period. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Khalil, for your nice presentation. Thank you. I have only one question. Yes, sir. Do you have a balloon tipped pacemaker in your catheter? No, it's just endocardial lead without we balloon tip. Yeah, I, we hope that we have the endocardial balloon tip. I think this one will decrease. It's not harmful, yeah, without this complication. With yes. The yes. We'll yes. open the door for any questions. Uh, I have a comment for this case. Really, I faced two cases like this one. Yeah. The first one was in the setting of complete heart block. The patient was uh, not in the case of ischemia. Mm -hmm. And we insert a temporary pacemaker, and then we do a permanent pacemaker, over removal of the temporary, the patient collapse, and mm -hmm. there's a bricardial effusion. And the second case, just like this one, yeah. uh, the important factor, I think, it is the lead of temporary pacemaker is somewhat this hard. And the majority of the patient with complete heart block being a fragile elderly patient. So there is a high risk for development of this uh, form of complication. Regarding the patient with ischemic, what we do is aspiration and auto transfusion for about uh, 24 hours. And there was a response. It was started to seal gradually. Another case was an ICD inserted and there was a perforation within the lead of ICD. And also the patient was on dual antiplatelet and continuous aspiration, giving it time, will uh, prevent the need for, I think, for surgery at certain time. So it is not a, a matter to immediately transfer the patient to the theater for surgical intervention. You have to give it time for the sealing. Yeah, we, tr we try to avoid in, uh, inferior STEMI if it's a suprahasian block by atropine, if it's reverted or by dopamine. We try to avoid not to put the temporary pacemaker. Yes. But it didn't regain his, his own rhythm. Yes, so we, we face a patient with inferior MI, yes, just yeah. like this. And there is a tamponade, but with aspiration and autotransfusion, the patient being more stable, and with the time, the reaccumulation stopped gradually, and there was no need for surgical intervention. Yeah. Dr. Nael. يعطيك العافية. بس أنا ما فهمتش الموضوع إنه المريض صار عنده تشست بين مرة ثانية وأخذته على الكات لاب وكان الإيكو ما كانش فيه فيوجن. يعني شو كان الكلو إن والله آه هذا راح يكون عنده راح لما نسحب الكاتيت راح يكون فيه صار عنده فيوجن وجهزنا التيم يعني شو كان الكلوز إن والله راح يكون هذا البين ناتج عن إنه راح يصير عنده فيوجن بعد ما نسحب البيس ميكرو. He was in the severe pain that was associated with it was يعني there is no cardiac enzyme leak no changes in his ECG. The same ischemic injury that was after the cath lab, uh, echo was fi fine. So the, there was two decisions, to either to cath him again or to remove the temporary pacemaker and see what will happen. Uh, the temporary pacemaker, when we go back to the, to the injury that I uh, show you, uh, there the tip of the pacemaker it was much angulated and deeply inserted inside the pericardium. So there was a plan for go going for a uh, cardiac CT scan to see the tip of the pacemaker. Due to his intractable angina, we couldn't wait. So go for the temporary pacemaker removal. We was activating the cath lab for both. If we remove the, two, the temporary pacemaker wire that didn't happen anything, we go for cath again to see the patency of the stent and etc. So we sent him for the cath lab for the first differential diagnosis is TPM injury for his endocardium of the RV. Uh, d d did you reverse anticoagulation before removal uh, of the wire? Excuse me. D did you reverse anticoagulation no, no, anti before removal no. of the wire? No. No anticoagulation. You didn't use anticoagulation. He wasn't on. He, he wasn't. He wasn't on. Uh, he oh, wasn't on an anticoagulation. Just his pledges. He, he wasn't. Uh, no, no. This is the second day. Second day. The second day. Uh, I think the most important alarming sign which draw the attention is the sudden deterioration of the patient. In most of these cases, the patient will start to deteriorate gradually. Pressure will be on the left side, and tachycardia will be even developed. And this is the alarming sign. And the first thing to do is to do an echo study uh, to detect the early accumulation and then transfer the patient. So the most important alarming sign for the development of this complication, it is the patient start deteriorate for any sibling cause, and the first to do it is the echo study. I might go severe hypoxia. 
our attention. Uh, we'll search for the cause. Monitor ischemia or anemia, locally hematoma or retroperitoneal, uh, retroperitoneal hemorrhage or allergy. If these, all these are excluded, uh, there may be perforation and the guide blood itself doing selling of perforation. At that time, we we'll, uh, uh, we'll draw the wire slightly and do angio. And at that time, we will <coughs> find the cause of hypertension. Uh, just about sealing of perforation, whether by uh, 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 Bessemaker catheter or even with this very small, small tip. narrow uh, wire of PCI. Uh, this is different. In the setting of uh, BCI, we're dealing with uh, gauge of the wire, it is just 14. And we dealing with temporal pacemaker. It is a tough and larger one. There is no comparison regarding the size of perforation between them. And in the setting of PCI, usually there is uh, no uh, rapid collapse of the patient. And in most of the cases, ended with aspiration or even just uh, regular follow-up. But in the setting of the base maker, it is a large one. And it is uh, somewhat larger than that developed during the course of PCI. But what is different in the, in the setting of VCI, there is dual antiplatelet, which may exacerbate the situation. Okay, we came to the end of this session. Thank you, everyone, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, 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 we'll call for the next uh, panel for the next session. Thank you.